I'd like to welcome you to our September um, virtual seminar for the Australasian Mycological Society. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm uh, on today. That's for the, the Yagamba, Turbal and Yagara people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Before we get into today's seminar, I wanted to talk a little bit about the 2022 AMS Symposium coming up in November. We're hosting that as part of the New Zealand Microbiological Society's annual conference. We're essentially having a satellite meeting on the Friday of their conference um, focused primarily on mycology. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look into it yet, please do. Um, it's really quite um, reasonable in terms of cost and it's going to be in a beautiful location um, with lots of um, exciting um, events happening. We've got um, a plenary speaker um, who's going to be extremely interesting and we've got student activities. There's a student travel grant available um, and we also have a field trip to the um, National Park um, at Wellington too. So please check that out. Um, and then secondly, um, the other announcement I wanted to make is for our AGM, which is happening in September on the 21st. So members are welcome to attend that. Um, and then anyone can also join in for the seminar, which we'll be hosting just prior to the uh, AGM. And that features Professor Roger Chavas with um, his uh, very ambitious title of Saving Planet Earth. So I'm sure that'll be one worth tuning into. Um, but yeah, um, let me get started. Today's seminar is, um, thank you, Anthony, um, is, uh, Host is presented by Dr. Anthony Young. He's a senior lecturer in crop protection with the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences at UQ. He has formerly worked in the Queensland DPINF as a bacteriologist and has worked as an extension officer in the New South Wales sugar industry. Uh, if you have any questions during Anthony's talk, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or during the discussion afterwards, you can raise your hand and ask Anthony the question directly. Um, so let's get straight into it. Thank you, Anthony. Take it away. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm just going to go back one. I've heard of a hard act to follow, but this is a hard act to proceed. Um, Roger, who I used to work with in the herbarium, going to save the planet Earth with taxonomy. I haven't got a hope. Um, you guys instead have a bacteriologist who's going to be talking about a disease caused by something closely related to an alga. So here we go. <laughs> I've got my talk streaking away. Um, solving the chlorotic streak disease riddle. So first of all, um, for those who don't know me, I actually grew up on the Clarence River on a cane farm. And if I could knock over my older brother, I'll be a fifth generation cane farmer as well. My first paid job was planting cooch runners on the McLean showground pitch. And now I'm doing a little bit of work on turf. Um, I feel um, honored that I got $90 for two days work um, that year. I went to Macquarie Uni and I didn't do any botany or anything like that. I just did a Bachelor of Science um, and I didn't have a major, but I did mainly biology, um, a fair bit of chemistry as well. For my honours year, I did lichen symbionts, so the algae and the fungi that constitute lichens, and also a study on velvet worm hybrid zones. And both of these subjects in a roundabout way um, very much helped me in my future career because when you think about the lichen symbiosis, um, that's one part of the, I guess, the disease spectrum where organisms interact with each other very closely. In the velvet worm hybrid zone, I learned a lot about hybrid uh, dynamics. And as I'll show you shortly, that's very important for our understanding of sugarcane. Not being able to secure gainful employment upon my graduation, I accepted a PhD scholarship um, that was partly funded by SRDC, which was the Sugar Research Development Corporation, to study return stunting disease of sugarcane at the BSES, the Bureau of Sugar Experiment Stations in Brisbane. Um, this disease was close to my heart because I spent most of my youth planting sugarcane every, every spring. And we heard about this disease that was invisible um, and was otherwise causing very significant yield losses. I can't say that I remember seeing any chlorotic streak in my youth. It was much later when I, when I met that disease. So as Tracy mentioned, I spent a goodly portion um, within the DPI. I joined the DPI and F in Mariba, where I, by virtue of replacing the former bacteriologist, became the Queensland bacteriologist. 
And later on, I was with Didi, uh, which the department evolved into, um, where I was working with Roger's group as a molecular taxonomist. I got into a bit of a barney with biosecurity about pineapples. I've just published a paper on that, just incidentally, if you look in Australasian plant pathology. Um, and so I became an extension officer. I thought I was going to leave um, science, and so I became an extension officer in the sugar industry. And that's where I got to know this disease. Since then, I've worked at USQ and now at UQ as a senior lecturer. Um, my active research interests, these are things that I'm either recently published within the past two years on, or things that I'm working on public publishing. I'm, I guess I'm interested in a lot of different things. Um, perhaps I should be more focused, uh, but biology is such a wonderful subject and having molecular skills, I can apply my molecular biology and, and epidemiology to a range of different um, disease presentations. I'm just gonna point out the near the bottom um, with collaborators, I'm, I'm collaborating on a project that has just been awarded ARC linkage funding to look at Eremophila seed biology. So Eremophila is the, the, the emu bush. And um, yeah, so really excited about that starting as well. I do a significant amount of teaching. So I teach plant and environmental health, plant protection, and animal and plant biosecurity. And I teach into a range of different subjects. And of course, being in a university setting, I have to try and publish, otherwise I won't have a career. So currently I've got 47 papers, five submitted and five book chapters that I've published as well. But I've got other interests. I've got three kids at primary school and having one drop off versus multiple daycare, kindies, heavenly. Um, I love bird watching, I love cricket and I love the ocean. And I love writing stuff. So. Here's a little sample of little, these are all get rich slow schemes of mine. Um, in particular, I draw your attention to Bent Bananas, which is a, a novel I'm currently looking for a publisher for. Um, I'll talk about that later if you want. It's a get rich slow scheme because it's been going for about 11 years and I haven't got rich yet, but that's another story. And hard quiz. Definitely, if you have the opportunity, go on hard quiz. My, my second topic for hard quiz wasn't Ned Kelly, it was sugar cane. And that's what I'm here to talk to you guys about. Enough about me, let's talk about chlorotic streak. Here you can see the symptoms of chlorotic streak. As its name suggests, it is a chlorotic streak. It's a yellow, irregular margin. Um, it goes red in the middle where the cane leaf starts dying. Um, but it's actually a waterborne disease. And we've known it's been waterborne since virtually it was discovered. So of course it's worse in the La Nina years. My grandmother, told me the three things I should know about cane farming is drain, drainage and drainage. And they say that you can grow cane in dust, but not mud. And part of that is because of this disease. It's, it's much worse in the La Nina years where it's wetter. You, in addition to having the characteristic streams, you have these internal symptoms, um, particularly uh, in the xylem, particularly at the nodes, these little red streaks that are apparent when you slice the cane with a sharp knife. It can be transmitted vegetatively. And I'll show you a bit more information on that as well. You, as you might expect, you get quite a lot of susceptibility variation in cultivars. Now, cultivated variety, often the farmers will call it a variety of sugar cane or cultivars. Some are more resistant than others. But when I started on this problem, we basically didn't know the susceptibility of any of our modern hybrids. Losses can approach complete. When I say complete, um, a farmer will grow the cane to you know, get profit, of course. When the yields get too low, they'll stop returning. So when I say return, they harvest the cane, they propagate it vegetatively, they harvest it, then a new crop grows, just like your lawn. When you mow your lawn, you don't really plant the grass, it just comes up again. But after a while, for a whole range of different factors, that sugar cane crop is no longer profitable. And so when chlorotic streak gets into it, and I'll show you some stunting in a little while, those losses can be complete, so the farmer gets rid of that. The disease itself can occasionally affect other grasses, so in particular sorghum and guinea grass, it's been known to, to infect. Now, although the disease was discovered back in 1927, the pathogen was unknown until very recently. I'm going to talk to you guys about how it was discovered. 
So here's some symptoms of the stunting associated with chlorotic streak. On the left, you can actually see the streaks on that quite stunted and, and ugly looking stool of sugarcane versus the nice green, healthier ones beside it, which obviously don't have the infection. And here you can see when I mentioned it's waterborne, you'll often see it will follow rows. Um, this was heavily affected. Uh, there's two varieties here. One variety on the left is actually a South, um, uh, South American variety from Brazil. The one on the right was one bred in, um, in Australia. Um, and it's more resistant than this one on the left. Okay, to understand chlorotic streak, we have to understand something about the history of sugarcane. Most of you will know that sugarcane originated in New Guinea. A lot of you probably won't know that it is considered the first crop domesticated by humans. And that was about 10,000 years ago. So before wheat and before rice and maize and before sweet potatoes, uh, this was the first domesticated crop. The original industries were based on two species, which are arguably one species. They're called Saccharum barbari and Saccharum sinensis. The later industries were based on Saccharum officinarum. Now, officinarum was what Linnaeus himself named this plant. But the modern industries are based on Saccharum officinarum interspecific hybrids. When I say interspecific, largely with a cane called Saccharum spontaneum, which I'll introduce very soon. And among the crops that humans grow, sugarcane is famous for having hundreds of sugarcane pests and diseases. And if you go for Queensland in the state of origin, you can thank the presence of the greyback cane beetle associated with sugarcane in Australia um, for the introduction of the cane toad, Rhinella marina, by a gentleman called Montgomery, under orders by Arthur Bell. Okay, Saccharum spontaneum is a highly promiscuous cane that originated in Northern India. We know that because that's where the types are that have the lowest chromosome number, 2n equals 40. It spread from North India across to Africa and down even into Australia. And you have types of Saccharum spontaneum across the whole spectrum, 2n equals 42, 44, um, maybe not all the numbers are there, 2n equals 120, up to 2n equals 128. And how it did this is it mated with endemic grasses everywhere it went. It's so, uh, let's say, um, chromosomally plastic. It can, it can reproduce and have fertile offspring. And, and it spread right across that region. Never got to the Americas. Now, an ancient Saccharum spontaneum or something like an Saccharum spontaneum got to New Guinea, the, the island of New Guinea. And there it hybridized relatives unknown to form a sugar cane called Saccharum robustum. Now Saccharum robustum has two and equals 80, which is exactly the same as its successor, Saccharum officinarum, which was selected by the people of New Guinea for its color and for its sweetness and for its softness. And we know it was domesticated because you will not find Saccharum officinarum anywhere apart from where humans were living or still live currently. And the chewing canes are still there at the moment. This particular cane, oh, so Saccharum robustum has virtually no sugar. It's, it's not a sweet cane, but through human agency, it was selected to make it make some sweet kinds. Now, this Saccharum officinarum, through human trade, ancient prehistoric trade, made it to the mainland where it hybridized again with Saccharum spontaneum, forming what we call two species, but it's arguably one species, Saccharum sinensi and Saccharum barbari. And of course, Saccharum officinarum also spread into that Pacific region. And so you do get some chromosomally aberrant forms like 2n equals 82, for example. Um, but yeah, so that's these ancient canes, the Saccharum sinensi and Saccharum barbari supported the ancient sugarcane industries, the sugarcane industries that extended all the way to Spain, for example. So here's a graphic that shows where a lot of the sugarcane industries were. And it might interest you guys to know that this is sugarcane that we've got, but of course, sugar beet also produces significant sugar. And it was because Britain ruled the waves that we have a sugar beet industry because some scientists presented to Napoleon himself 
some sugar that was formed out of beetroot, beta vulgaris, sugar beet. And he was so excited about that because he couldn't get any sugar in because the British were blockading the, the, the sea lanes. So he was so excited, he got them to plant out a whole heap of this and that's where the sugar beet industry comes from. So this is, this might not be entirely accurate, but this gives you an idea of where sugar is grown currently, uh, apart from the ore that's now gone. But what I want to point out is it was never until relatively recently planted in New Guinea. We never had commercial sugar operations in New Guinea until relatively recently. And, and we do now, and personally, I think it's a bit of a travesty because we, we, we set up these industries with interspecific hybrids and we've introduced diseases into New Guinea that were never there before. In addition to others, return stunting disease, sugarcane smut, and probably, as we'll show later, chlorotic street disease. Okay, in Australia, and I owe Brett Summerall this knowledge because he put me to the, the key reference. We know that sugarcane came over in 1788 with the first fleet. It was picked up in South Africa. Um, as such, it was probably that Saccharum sinensi form, which are growing in South Africa at the moment, and it was established in the botanical gardens back in 1788. It moved up the coast. It got to Kempsey in about the 1850s, but it was just too cold and the frost was. The Clarence River, which is currently the southernmost extant sugarcane uh, region in Australia, it's about 1860. And that was an area you could grow cane sustainably. And this, this is my forebear. So my ancestor, Richard Ma, came over from Tipperary in 1863 and he married a daughter of convicts. And, and there's my brother down the bottom, Matt Young, my dad, John Young, my grandmother, Edith, and her father, Dennis. So we're a fifth generation cane farming family. And the cane from the Clarence spread up the coast and it's an iconic crop. And actually it was tied up in our push for federation in 1901. In my historic analysis, I found one paper that says the safest guard for the integrity of Australia is to have white sugarcane growers up the coast. It's, you want to get, you want to write that now, but that's the sugar industry was meant to guard Australia from the hordes that are going to come and try and invade. So it's, a, it's an iconic crop, and I think it's the number one crop in Queensland. Okay, our modern hybrids. In Java, you had a company called the Dutch East India Company. Batavia, I think it used to be called. They got canes from everywhere. They got canes from India. They got canes from Africa. They got canes from New Guinea, Philippines, Formosa. And there are some breeders, and I'll talk to you about them shortly, produced these commercial cultivars that went everywhere. This is before the period of plant breeding rights. If you made a good variety of cane, you gave it to all your competitors and you, you took the glory of having made this wonderful cane. So these hybrids were sent everywhere where sugar cane was then grown. And largely because of this man. This is Jacob Jesuit. Jakob Jesuit, who was a professor at Wageningen and also a plant breeder. He is considered the uh, one of the fathers of sugarcane tax taxonomy and also one of the fathers of breeding. He classified those canes, the uh, Saccharum barbari and Sinensi, based on their hair and their bud characters very systematically. He was the one who produced this sugarcane called POJ2878, the Javan wonder cane this sugarcane variety that had hybrid characteristics of resistance from one of the parents plus sugar from the Sacrum Officium um, mother. And it basically went everywhere. And, I, and I've already postulated in a previous paper during my PhD thesis that the release of this variety is what released a lot of sugarcane diseases around the world, in particular, return stunting disease. He's considered the father of sugarcane breeding, and I perhaps have been guilty of further entrenching him as the father of sugarcane breeding because he's not. He did a lot, but someone else played a role. Jacob Yesui became a member of the Dutch Nationalist Socialist Movement. He collaborated with Germany in World War II, and he was dishonorably discharged and jailed. 
not a great look. So when he writes something like, then I tried also to combine the seedlings of Chuni and Kasua blood to have from both parents a strong roots, the immunity against Sarah and from one of the parents the immunity against, it's, I don't like reading it to be honest. Let me talk to you about the person who made it all happen, Gerharda Wilbrink. Most of the world don't know anything about Gerharda Wilbrink, but she was a Dutch PhD who came over to the Dutch East Indies, Indonesia, back in about 1910. And she was a, a pathologist who is a, a woman in very much a man's world who was formidable. In 1910, she was the one who crossed the Kasua, this wild relative, with POJ 100 and Cherubon and other varieties of sugarcane. And so she was the first person to successfully make interspecific crosses of sugarcane. So this is relatively lost to history. Yes, we, when he started, after she had made the crossings, he selected from her seedlings. She was moved into a different Part. She was doing pathology then, but yes, we used her seedlings, and that's from how he got his POJ 2878. So, this is the cross that Gerharda Wilbrink made, and the cross that gave us the POJ 2878 was one of her seedlings with another Sacrum officiant. So, that's Gerharda Wilbrink. She was the one who discovered chlorotic streak back in 1927, and she called it the fourth disease. She didn't call it chlorotic streak. She hated that name. She called it the fourth disease because it was distinct from gummy, Sarah, and root rot. So Sarah, we think, was a phytoplasma disease, but since Gerharda's work, it, it's virtually disappeared. So she presented on this fourth disease at the Puerto Rican International Society of Sugarcane Technologists Congress. This was a this is an amazing meeting in terms of the history of sugarcane propagation worldwide. Um, I've already mentioned to you Arthur Bell, who was responsible for introducing the cane toads into Australia. It was at this meeting that he saw them in action and thought, yeah, we need to get some of those. It was Arthur Bell who gave us the studies into six soils that launched our variety of yield decline joint ventures and all these sorts of things. This meeting in 1932, it's one of those things, if you had a time machine and you were interested in sugarcane, that would be a good one to go to. And in these um, proceedings of these conferences, um, the secretaries would actually type down the conversations and, and you get to hear Gerharda um, eviscerating her opponent. She's, she's a magnificent um, woman. Not only did she give us the first interspecific hybrid, she gave us Wilbrink's medium for Xanthomonas. That was when I first heard her name when I was doing some work on a strawberry um, angular leaf spot outbreak. Um, we were using Wilbrink's media to, to, to grow it up. She gave us hot water treatment for disease management, which is still being used right across Australia, sugarcane, and worldwide today. She learned that she could grow seed cane in mountain nurseries to prevent them from getting the Sera disease. And she developed knowledge on the mosaic disease epidemiology. And the more I look into her achievements, the more I find that she has done. So if you haven't heard of Will, uh, Wilbrink, she's one of the greatest unsung heroes of, of plant pathology and science. And I'm, if you haven't heard of her, I'm glad to introduce you to her. Go to Wilbrink. Okay, that's the history I wanted to start you with. Let's just go back to where, where I came into this thing. I mentioned I was working with the DPI, the Queensland Government, and then I left over that pineapple thing and I become an extension officer. And when I become an extension officer, this is my first newsletter I put out, I thought, well, okay, while I'm walking away from science, this could give me an opportunity to put my PhD research, my plant pathology skills into practice. So I thought, in the back of my mind, I thought this might give me a chance to tackle return stunting disease. And this is a, some sugar cane with the internal symptom of the return stunting disease. Not much to go on. But when I started, the biggest talk was about sugar cane smut. So as you're probably aware, the sugar cane smut uh, was in West Australia for a long time up in the, the Kimberley, but it arrived in around Bundaberg in about 2006. And by 2011, early 2011, the first sugarcane smut was found on the Clarence River. 
And so um, all the growers were really concerned about this, this fungus that was, um, you know, associated with the sugar cane. So I get down there, they're all talking about that, but we had very, very wet conditions. You remember 2011, the Brisbane floods? Well, we had floods down there in New South Wales too. And it turns out that chlorotic streak disease was actually the biggest issue. Everywhere I went, I could find more and more chlorotic streak disease. So I started thinking, how can we actually work on this in among everything else? So as an extension officer, I had to try and identify weeds for the farmers, how to control the weeds, how to calibrate spray tanks, shooting levels for drainage, varieties, CCS. Um, it was a very intense period. And as you're probably aware of, so I was like the last, well, I think I was the last appointed BSCS extension officer. Then the BSCS got rid of extension officers. So I joined New South Wales Sugar in the same role. And then Sugar Research Australia emerged out of, out of BSCS. So I missed the May 2009 flood and the January 2011 flood. But when I was on the clearance, we had the January 2012 flood, then we had a 2013 flood, then we had another flood in February and another flood in March. And as you can see by the picture, um, and if you know the Clarence River, you know it's a floodplain, it's not much high ground, it's very, very flat. When you have floods, everything goes under. So we'd had six floods since May 2009 and five floods since January 2011. And these last five floods are all are occurring virtually in summer, in our hotter months. And we knew from work going back to Brian Egan's day in the 1960s around Bundaberg that the chlorotic streak disease organism, whatever it was, we know it's waterborne and we know it likes warmer water than colder water. And so you can see we've got the perfect conditions for an epidemic of chlorotic streak disease. And that's what we had. We had massive loss in yields associated with the flooding. I'm not saying all this yield loss is directly attributable to the chlorotic streak organism, but we certainly dropped our yields by about half. And we had the lowest cane yields in tons per hectare in more than 50 years. And the, the previous 50 years was on the back of the 1959 flood. And the, there's a lot of flooding in the 50s as well. So you can see we had much reduced yields. And I remember getting a phone call from a farmer and he asked, Anthony, can cane grow backwards? <laughs> I thought he was mad. So I went out and had a look and this is a photo I took. And I guess it was an optical illusion for him because all the cane that wasn't affected was growing and the cane that was affected wasn't. So it looked like it was actually growing backwards. And then I started looking at the epidemiology across the Clarence Valley and I found three main varieties that were really the worst affected. The, these constituted the most reports I had of from them. So Q203, Empire and SP were the worst. And some of them were less affected, 232, 3120, and 208. And then when we look at the harvest by variety in that year, 2012, you can see that Empire and 203 make up close to 50% of all the cane we harvested. And so our main varieties are the worst affected by this disease. There was no obvious pathology of nematodes. It was CSD that was causing these losses. And so that gave me an opportunity to do some ratings. So this is our clean seed plot. So when we control another disease, return sunning disease, we release hot water treated, vegetative propagative material. And this is our plot. There's about 20 varieties in that plot. And there was flooding right throughout. And so that gave us an equal opportunity for infection. You couldn't say that one stalk got more chance of getting infected than the others. And it reduced confounding factors because there's no other diseases that we knew that were present in those plots. So I generated ratings for all of our varieties that came we had, and I gave them to BSCS, SRA, who uploaded them onto SpidNet. And so at this stage, we have 20 ratings for varieties that we never had before. At the same time, we started doing field inspections. So going out and seeing whether or not the ratings we have made in a controlled, semi-controlled, circumstances apply to what we're seeing in the field. And we did this over three years on a scale of zero, none, none evident, up to three, heavily infected. And we got a reasonable correlation with the ASP ratings. There was a little bit of variation, but reasonable correlation. 
It allowed us to find out other things. It allowed us to confirm unequivocally the relationship between rainfall and CSD. In the two really wet years, we have much more CSD. When it dried out in 2014, we had much less. Great. We also found evidence of vegetative transmission. And I'll just quickly go through this graph. I split the varieties into new varieties and old varieties that were in our mother plots of our approved seed plots. And I've got the same varieties, new and old, that are out on the farms. So when I say new variety, if we've only got it in the past seven or eight years versus older varieties, varieties that have been with us for 10, 15, 20 years. And you can see that while there's virtually no difference in the susceptibility between the new and the old varieties in a controlled or semi-controlled environment, when we have them in the field, we have much more CSD in our older varieties. And that's because we're getting vegetative transmission because farmers are planting out material that already has the disease. Newer varieties have less chance, less time to have picked up the disease than the old varieties. Okay, then we had a breakthrough. When I say we had a breakthrough, Kathy Braithwaite at the BSES had a breakthrough. On the tail end of another project that was looking at Ramu stump disease in PNG, as well as chlorotic streak in Australia. She tried some primers that she got off a collaborator who were meant to hit the actin gene, I believe, from uh, oomycete. And she found a 750 base pair amplicon, which was consistently associated with CSD symptomatic tissue. Now, this was an absolute um, breakthrough that we've never had before. Now we had a DNA target, and potentially a DNA test, that we could use to try and identify a chlorotic streak and fundamentally find out what is actually causing it. But the DNA sequence came back with no hits. It was, it was gobbledygook. It was basically, we have an amplicon, but that's it. So how do we turn that amplicon into something we can work with? So she got this amplicon out of the xylem. So the first thing I did is I, I got my old pump that we're using for return starting disease diagnostics, and I, I grabbed a stalk, and I pumped out some of the xylem sap. And I looked on the microscope and I found these beautiful little green balls in the symptomatic cane. I thought, aha, this is the chlorotic streak organism. But then I went to non-infected cane and I found the same little balls, which was really disappointing. What I didn't know at the time, of course, is that, no, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. We certainly had an opportunity to crack this case. So I applied to Sugar Research Development Corporation. I put in a what we call a preliminary research proposal to undertake next generation sequencing. Now, everyone's so familiar with next generation sequencing now, but in 2012, it was still relatively new. And so I saw the potential to use this technology to crack this case. At the same time, BSES submitted a PRP to undertake genome walking. And, and there's a rider in there that said, if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll try next generation sequencing. But remember at the time, the head pathologist said, we had a meeting, the head pathologist said, um, such and such has done a one day course in next generation sequencing and doesn't think it's going to work. And I'm like, well, let's try it anyway. SRDC came back and they said they'll fund one project, but they wouldn't fund both projects. So we have to work together. And that was, a little bit tricky because there's some history, right? So we're going to try and work together to find what this OO, we thought it was an OMIC was. At the same time, I planted, I had a day off in 2012 in the season and I planted some clean sugarcane, some disease-free sugarcane in a little seed bed on my father's farm of the variety Empire, which is highly susceptible. You can see this picture here is Empire. It shows really clear symptoms. So I thought I plant that just in case. And I lobbied SRDC to keep the next generation sequencing in the budget. And that their response to me was, the SCS says that the genome walking will work and they'll only do next generation sequencing if it doesn't work. So they were keen to take that out of the budget. And I'm like, no, you've got to keep this in. I had multiple phone calls, email streams, et cetera, to try and keep that in the budget. In the end, it was kept in the budget. And between 2011, December 2011 and April 2013, the BSES had sequenced about 1,300 bases. They had 750 bases, but they'd sequenced another 
you know, a little bit more, 550 odd bases. So while my issues with genome walking, and I've presented this previously, if we take a chromosome, let's say the gene that was randomly amplified is there, we want to walk down the chromosome to find something more diagnostic, like a ribosomal gene, a calmodulin gene, a translation elongation factor alpha, whatever it's going to be, right? But what if they're down there? You can be going a long time. Now, at that stage, 1,300 bases would represent 0.03% of a single 4 million base pair chromosome. Now, the smallest known OMIC genome at that stage was 28 million bases. And let's say it was on a different chromosome. The original amplicon was extended by 550 bases in 15 months. So that's 1.2 bases per day, or let's say three coffees per base. At that rate, if it had an average size genome of an OMIC, it would take 228,000 years. If it had the smallest genome possible, it would take 64,000 years to get it at that rate. And as I said in an email to, um, yeah, well, we've got microsatellites could get in the way, secondary structures, an outbreak of something new. And as I said at the time, I said, it's like setting off for a road trip around Australia on a moped while the Ferrari is in the garage. Anyhow, we had a meeting up at Tully about 18 months in, about halfway through the project. And thankfully the chromosome crawling method was abandoned. And we collect samples of Q241 from Tully. Um, and the team came down to Harwood. I was with them. We collected the samples, pumped the xylem. The team came down to Harwood. Um, we went to Empire on my dad's farm. Um, and we, we got samples out of there. We all scrubbed them clean. We pumped them all out together. Um, and Dr. Chung No from SRA uh, undertook the Illumina analysis where he had infected and, and non-infected. It turns out that while we tried to have non-infected samples from Harvard as well, we we're on a floodplain. Even though it didn't have symptoms, all of them lit up with the PCR. It was very difficult to find any sugarcane at that period that did not have this pathogen present. And the rest is history. Chung with David Bass from Britain um, and, and others in the team identified Phytocircomonas venonatus. It's a circozoan. And as far as we know, it's the only circozoan that's pathogenic. And they look like little green balls. <laughs> they are, <laughs> they're little green balls. Um, I've seen them before. This is from the publication in Phytopathology. Now, obviously this is a pretty important breakthrough. Um, it had to be written up. I found out about the first write-up um, in a project report and I wasn't an author. I was left off the International Society of Sugarcane Technology paper. And I, I rang up Peter Sampson, who's a program manager at SRA, said, why aren't I on this paper? And I was on, I was put back on the, I was put on the paper, and there I am at the very last. I was made the senior author <laughs> no, for this paper. That didn't work for the phytopathology paper that came out after, but I was I was left off the Cox Boston's paper. So I guess um, I guess there's always going to be some element of politics, et cetera, associated with science. But I think as scientists, we can do better. Okay, what is a circumina, do you say? Well, is it an alga? Is it a chromist? Where do they come from? This is a tree of the eukaryotes made by Berkey et al. in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Your circumonads are these rhizarian groups. Just so you know where we are, we're part of this amorphia and we, with the fungi, I know you're a Queensland Mycological Society, you are an epistocontum, something like that. If you really want to damage your neurons, spend a lot of time trying to understand eukaryotic phylogenies. I mean, bacteria, fungi, varsity, varsity, more interesting. These deep branching of these groups are really head destroying. Okay, so I'm going to finish up very shortly. This I presented as part of our um, part of my work on return stunting disease and the origin of return stunting disease, where I found one single clone of the pathogen everywhere I looked. If the bacterium came from New Guinea, number one, it would have been present in New Guinea prior to 2002. Number two, we would have had 
whole lot of different strains come out, but that's not what happened. What happened is we had the Indo-Pacific crossing in Java and they went everywhere where cane was grown. I'm putting this in now because I wonder if this is exactly the same thing that's happened with the chlorotic streak disease. Did Gerharda Wilbrink, when she crossed the Saccharum spontaneum line, accidentally introduce a pathogen of Saccharum spontaneum into what we now call commercial hybrids of sugarcane? Is it coincidence that she discovered this in 1927, just as these crosses were being conducted and started being disseminated around the world? Is it coincidence that Arthur Bell, when he found it in Australia, it was on one of these hybrids, the POJ2878? Likewise in Hawaii and other areas. Makes me wonder whether or not, and this is sort of before the period of the, our first quarantine house for sugarcane, for example, was built in 1935. This is all happening before then. Is this how we got chlorotic streak disease all over the place? So finally, when we had our 2012 harvest, we had a whole lot of susceptible varieties. By 2014, our two biggest varieties constituted only 5% of what we planted. And instead we're planting highly resistant varieties, about 50% of them with Q208 and 232. And if we have a look at the yield, you know, there's, there's, I know there's a lot of things going to yield. Nonetheless, we had 2015 was a really good season, but 2015 had the highest yields in the modern era. When I say in the modern era, since mechanical harvesting came in. We also had the highest one-year-old yields on record. And this period has been the longest sustained period of above average yields. The, the previous record was four years. We're currently one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're, we're really reaping the benefits of employing resistant varieties to this disease, as well as our work on return stunting disease. So conclusions. The causal agent was solved after 90 years. This should have been a nature paper, in my opinion, um, when the routine stunting disease organism was found 40 years after it was discovered, the disease, that went into science. I think this could have been a nature paper. Um, the sum of the samples that gave us this was taken from one of the oldest cane farms in Australia, and I love that. We still don't understand anything about the natural situation of this magnificent organism. And was it potentially an endophyte or a pathogen of Saccharum spontaneum? We need to do much more work. We're going to finish up with some acknowledgements. Mark Ensby and Steve Loach and Wayne Davis for technical assistance in the field. SRDC and later SRA for funding the research. A big mention to Peter Sampson, particularly Chun, uh, Chong Nu, who did the uh, next generation sequencing that solved this. And of course, Kathy Braithwaite for um, finding that amplicon. Alan Williams and Kay uh, Wang from uh, UQ have helped me with some of the analysis. And Ruby Yearsman is doing some research on this with me at the moment. Uh, finally, thank you, Tracy, for inviting me to speak and for the AMS for allowing a bacteriologist to infiltrate your inner sanctum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was fascinating. Um, it's really lovely to have uh, a great variety of research presented on this series. So um, thank you so much for agreeing to come on board. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions uh, to the audience, please, please, can you please uh, put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen? But I'm going to take host privilege and ask the first uh, question. Um, so you said that um, the more uh, more recently the varieties planted have been tended to be more resistant. Um, now, I'm just wondering if that has continued over the last seven years of yield. Have you found any differences in resistance levels amongst the, the um, more highly used varieties of sugarcane lately? Or is that too yeah, so That's a great question, Tracy. I'm not actually based on the clearance at the moment, um, but I've got strong contacts there. Um, we continue to discuss this. I was actually asking the um, my successor as the extension officer and one of the technical field officers I, I listed whether they had any chlorotic streaks. I'm keen to get some more samples to do some more research and they say they haven't seen any for ages. That's good to hear. Um, and um, it is uh, chlorotic streak, you said it is actually a, a, at a global level. So um, where else is, uh, did they find um, high levels of disease occurrence? 
Um, again, I haven't actually travelled too widely in other sugarcane growing areas. Yeah, yeah. The main centres, and it's typically associated with um, lower ground um, water logging area. Um, we also found some. We also found some really interesting epidemiological data, which I didn't include, that found that growers who grew their cane on mounds, like uh, raised beds, have less chlorotic streak than those who grow it on the flat. So that indicates that if you get the water off the field really quickly and you keep the cane slightly above it, then you're going to have better outcomes associated with this chlorotic streak. Um, what I would love to do is get chlorotic streak samples from all over the world and see whether or not genetically they're identical, whether there's much variation in them, if there are differences in susceptibility. There's a whole lot of um, different research we'd like to do on that front. I bet. Um, I did do a bit of Googling on your um, uh, hard quiz achievements too. <laughs> I couldn't find an episode available, so I'll have to keep searching, but <laughs> I saw a couple of screenshots, so <laughs> you, <laughs> looks like you, it was you, a bit of fun. <laughs> no, you, you, you probably won't find that. But, um, Tom Gleason was so annoyed at me for what I did at the end of the episode that uh, I think... <laughs> now you intrigue me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be very, that one, that particular episode would be nearly impossible to find. We'll have to chat about that sometime. Um, okay, so the other question I had um, now, obviously, chronic streak disease uh, reduces yield. Um, what are the other symptoms other than the visual streaking? Um, does it reduce root um, quality or what? what is the symptoms? Yeah, yeah, so it's actually a root, and this is what held up research on chlorotic streak for so long because it's got this beautiful streak, which is such a clear, obvious symptom that. All the previous pathologists were looking for the microorganism that was causing it in that in that streak, but it's actually an organism that attacks the roots and it gets into the xylem vessels. And we don't ex exactly know how it forms the streak, but we don't think it's the organism actually present in the actual streak. So it's, it's an organism that attacks the root. They have reduced root mass inside when you slice the cane. Um, you do have these red streaks which are um, they're bright red they're not just at the lower nodes like other sugarcane diseases they, they go right up the stalk when you see that um it's pretty good evidence that you've got chlorotic streak and that that reddening is believed to be the phenol oxidase response um, gums made by the sugarcane to inhibit whatever's living in those island vessels so you often see that red associated with multiple different pathogenic presentations but that's, they're, they're, the, they're the main symptoms. Um, in older sugarcane, it can be difficult to see the symptoms because as the cane leaves senesce, they go brown, you, you can't pick the symptoms. Different times of year, they're more obvious, but it's perhaps the simplest sugarcane disease to diagnose because when you see those streaks, nothing else makes them. Yeah, at least it's got a, basically a, a, a good flag <laughs> to say, look out, this is where it is. Um, Bev and Weir's saying, firstly, thanks, a really great talk. Um, must have been quite a journey. Um, he also asks, are other species in this genus or family known to cause diseases? No, well, there's, there's, actually, um, there's actually some debate about that. Like I've been contacted by um, Circozoan experts in the field who are surprised that the Circozoan is actually a pathogen because Circozoans, um, how do I describe them? They're, they're like an alga that either never had a wall or has lost the wall. And most circozoans are bacteria um, trophs. So they, they eat bacteria for their living. And that's, that's all they do. They just, they're, they're heterotrophic eating bacteria. Um, as far as we know, no other circozoan causes any disease on anything. And there's some argument within the circozoan community whether the chlorotic streak organism is causing the problem. Um, I'm sticking with Chung and the science. I'm saying it is the pathogen. Yeah, very interesting. Are they photosynthetic at all or not? Well, we've got these. Well, I I don't know. I, it depends <laughs> on it depends on where you look. I've I'm sure I've seen little chloroplasts in them, yeah. right? Okay. But then they're living in the soil. They're living under the water. Yeah. They're, they're, they're typically a freshwater group. They, they generally don't like saline conditions. Um, they're super abundant in many soils. 
Um, could they potentially be facultatively um, photosynthetic, like something like Clamidomonas? Maybe. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't know. Yeah, I can definitely see why it was um, assumed to be an OMI seat from the start. Um, has ticks all those boxes too, I suppose. Um, if there are any other questions, um, now's your chance. Don't forget you can raise your hand, um, but I will start to wrap up probably. Thank you so much, Anthony, for a really interesting talk. Um, really pleasure to have you on with us today. I think we're all gonna be Googling um, your name in pineapples, not to mention hard quiz. <laughs> thank you very much for hosting me and thank you everyone for your attention. Excellent, thanks, we'll see you later.